This week, our activities, content, and assignments will help you be able to do the following. Use a map containing latitude and longitude. Read and construct contour lines. Read topographic maps and be able to derive qualitative and quantitative data, like distance and elevation, from them. Interpret major topographical features such as hills, river valleys, and depressions. Determine the gradient of a feature such as a hill or a stream. Be able to construct a topographic profile and calculate its vertical exaggeration. And to understand how a topographic map represents Earth's surface and be able to create and interpret such a map. First, we'll start with some background information to provide you context for this week's lab. A map is a flat representation of Earth's surface as viewed from above. Maps serve as a visual representation of Earth's surface and come in several types, each designed to convey specific kinds of information. Our choice of how and what to display on a map can significantly influence our perception of the world shaping our understanding of geography and spatial correlation. Here is an official map of Argentina showing what is called a hammer projection, but the map is centered on Argentina. And compared to how we usually think of Earth, we might think that this map is also upside down. First, we'll take a look at map projections. The choice of projection depends on the map's purpose the geographic area it covers, and the properties that needs to be preserved most accurately. Each projection distorts Earth's surface in different ways because Earth is a three-dimensional object which we are attempting to represent on a two-dimensional plane. There are three main families of projections based on surface used, planar, cylindrical, and conic. Each has standard lines or points where Earth's surface directly touches the map surface minimizing distortion at these locations, but increasing it with distance from them. Shown here is a map projection we are all familiar with, the Mercator projection, a type of cylindrical projection. The first type of projection is the planar, also known as the azimuthal projection. This is the most straightforward example where a flat pane is placed on the Earth at some point, and the surface of Earth is represented directly on this plane. This is the orthographic projection, which is exactly how the Earth's surface would look from space. Beyond just an orthographic projection, a planar projection can also represent areas of Earth's surface which are not readily visible when observed as a globe. An example of azimuthal projection, which is not stereoscopic, but instead equidistant, is the UN logo, which depicts Earth as seen from the North Pole. The next type of projection is the cylindrical projection. If we imagine taking a piece of paper and wrapping it around the equator, this is the central cylindrical projection. The Mercator projection we saw earlier is another example of a cylindrical projection, but in this case, the cylinder is smaller in diameter than Earth, so some of the distortion ends up in the middle of the map as well as around the poles. Here is the central cylindrical projection. This map extends from 85 degrees south latitude to 85 degrees north latitude. Near the poles, we can see that the map becomes more and more stretched out, since we are attempting to represent smaller and smaller diameters still on the same distance on the rectangle, as the pole approaches zero diameter. The equator is, only, the, equator is the only place on the map where distance and latitude is correctly represented. Our third type of projection is the conic projection. With a similar approach to the cylindrical projection, now we take a conical sheet of paper and place it on the globe and then unroll it. These are good at representing places like North America when the cone is placed on the North Pole, but just as with other projection types, we can also orient the cone in any direction as we wish. If we orient the cone about some landmark, for example, BWI Airport, 
we can correctly represent radial distance from the airport on a map. This is indeed a navigation chart for pilots. Here, we see a specific type of conic projection called a Lambert conformal conic projection, or an LCC. Next, we'll talk about what conformal means in this context. As we have seen, there is no one perfect map projection. There will always be a compromise between the properties which are accurately represented on a map. In fact, a map projection can only accurately represent one of the following properties at a time. Equivalent projections accurately represent area. We can see on the right that the Mercator projection is not an equivalent projection. It vastly overrepresents the size of polar areas. Conformal projections accurately represent shapes and angles. The Mercator projection is conformal. Even though it overrepresents the size of continents, the actual shape of the continents is correct. Finally, we have equidistant projections which preserve distances along certain directions. It isn't possible to represent the correct distances in every direction, as this would mean that everything is correctly represented. Instead, for example, only the distance along meridians or along latitudes can correctly be represented. There's also a fourth category of map projections which do not preserve any one property. Instead, they attempt to minimize the distortions in multiple properties at once, which can be for aesthetic purposes. In order to more readily observe distortions on a map, we can utilize what is called Tissot's indicatrix, plural, indicatrices. If we drew a circle on actual Earth, then projected the same circle the same way that Earth's surface is being projected, we can then observe the distortion of that circle. On the left is an orthographic projection. We might think that there is no distortion of the indicatrices because it looks like a globe, but as a 2D representation, we can see that these circles are changing size and orientation. In the middle is the Mercator projection again, where we see that the circles remain circular, but increase in size as they extend towards higher latitudes. On the right is a Wagner projection, which is a compromise, so the circles vary in size, shape, and distance from each other, but not as drastically as in the Mercator projection, for example. Now that we have mentioned how maps are made, Let's talk about the main types of maps which we may encounter. We have planimetric maps, which often represent buildings and streets, topographic maps, which represent the elevation of Earth's surface, and we have geologic maps, which show us the different types of rock formations in an area. There are other types of maps depending on the type of information which is being displayed. For example, here we have a groundwater vulnerability index map of Ohio, which depicts an area's vulnerability to groundwater contamination based upon its hydrogeologic, topographic, and soil characteristics. Systems of creating, managing, analyzing, and mapping data are known as Geographic Information Systems, or GIS. The first type of map is probably the one that you're most familiar with. Planimetric maps are two-dimensional maps that represent the horizontal positions of features on Earth's surface. These maps don't provide any information about the shape of Earth's surface or changes in elevation. A topographic map is a type of map that shows elevation. These maps are a two-dimensional view of a three-dimensional landscape. Topographic maps are used by people like hikers and others who need to know what the elevation of an area is. Contour lines on a map illustrate lines of equal elevation. For example, a 2,000 meter contour line shows all line points on a map that have an elevation of 2,000 meters. These lines are always drawn at evenly spaced intervals. The space between consecutive contour lines is called the contour interval. In the example on the right, the contour interval is 50 meters, as there are 50 meters between the 50 and the 100 meter contours. Note, the contour interval for each map can be different. It's not always 50. An important rule to remember is that contour lines cannot cross. Think about what those lines do first. 
What are they there for? If two lines crossed, it would mean that one location had two different elevations, which is not possible. Drawing contour lines involves drawing lines that connect elevation of equal value in the field. It's important to remember that when you're drawing contour lines, you're not just connecting the dots, but you are trying to connect the dots of points that fit in your contour interval. So for example, this might go by tens, twenties, or fives. Um, and if it does go by tens, twenties, or fives, it's reasonable to assume that 120 is one of the contour lines. So you would connect all of the 120 points. Then if you were going by 20s, the next one up would be 140. Gradient is the change in elevation between two points over a distance. This is calculated as the rise or the change in elevation divided by the run or the distance between two points. We can expect to see a steeper gradient or slope where the lines are closer together. This indicates a more rapid change in elevation. This is something that you would expect to see around a hill or a mountain. When you see these in the stream channel, or these shapes here, the bend in the V points uphill and the stream flows opposite or out of the V shape. Decreases in elevation or depressions are shown with contour lines that have hatch marks or hasher marks drawn inside of the contours. Depressions and hills will always form closed loops like this, but if it's a depression, you'll see these hasher marks or hatch marks that are facing the inside of the circles. A topographic profile is the vertical cross-section that allows us to see how the topography varies along a line through the map. These are particularly useful when constructing geologic maps and looking into geologic cross-sections. A geologic map contains topographic lines and ages and types of rocks. Basically, it shows geologic features. This is similar to the topographic map that we've already been looking at, but it has much more information layered right on top of it. The most obvious feature here is color. There's lots of color. Each color represents either a different type of rock or a different age of rock. While coloring can vary from map to map, the United States usually uses reds and orange for igneous rocks, which were once molten. For rocks changed by heat and pressure, called metamorphic rocks, we tend to color those with shades of brown or olive green. Usually, solid colors show the rock is marine formed, and the ones with patterns on them show that the rock is terrestrial or formed on land. These features are usually explained in the map key or in the legend. Some of the features shown in geologic maps include the structures in this diagram. We discussed these in the first two labs, the scientific method lab and the plate tectonics lab, and a little bit in the geologic time lab as well, but we're going to review them here briefly. Divergent plate boundaries cause tensional stress. Tensional stress results in normal faults and or stretching and thinning of the crust, depending on how hot that crust material is. Convergent plate boundaries cause compressional stress. Compressional stress causes reverse faults, thrust faults, and folding. Transform plate boundaries cause shear stress. Shear stress results in strike-slip faults and or bending of the crust. Earth scientists measure the orientation of formations and then record the orientation data on maps and block diagrams using symbols. Attitude is the orientation of a rock layer, the surface, or a line relative to the horizontal or a compass direction. Earth scientists have devised a system of strike and dip for measuring and describing the attitude of tilted rock layers or surfaces so they can visualize how they have been deformed from their original horizontality. 
Strike and dip are usually measured directly from rock that's exposed at the surface, which is known as an outcrop, using a compass and a clinometer, which is a device for measuring the angle of inclined surfaces. However, they can be measured or estimated by the shapes of landforms observed from a distance or on aerial photographs or satellite images. The strike of an inclined or a tilted surface is a line formed where the surface intersects a horizontal plane, like the surface of the water puddle in this illustration. This strike here would be recorded as north 65 east. Dip is the angle and direction that water flows, or a ball rolls, down an inclined or a tilted surface. In this example, the dip is 30 degrees southeast. Symbols are used to represent strike and dip. The T-shaped symbol that you can see on this inclined rock unit here is used to represent the strike and dip of an inclined surface, as we see in the next illustration as well. To help us visualize strike and dip a little bit better using an object that we've probably all seen at some point, this is what strike and dip would look like, or how it would be represented rather, on a lawn chair. The seat of the lawn chair is horizontal, so you would use this particular symbol to indicate that you are looking at a horizontal rock layer, but the back part of the chair is steeply tilted. And um, we would see that represented with the strike and dip sign where the dip indicated that um, this rock layer or the back of this chair is um, steeply inclined. Next, we'll discuss information that you'll need to complete this lab. There's no safety information specific to this lab, and there are no helpful hints specific to this lab. The procedure and the worksheets are available for download in Carmen. Um, however, your TA will be able to provide you with the um, copies of the worksheets that you can use in class. Happy mapping!